Hi, welcome to this episode of Patient Education for the Educated Patient. This is part two of a two-part video series where we're talking about the results of the ARRIVE trial. The ARRIVE trial separated patients into two groups. One group was electively induced at 39 weeks. The other group was allowed to expectantly manage their labor, waiting for either spontaneous labor, another indication for induction, or another indication for delivery by C-section. The conclusions of the study were everybody should be induced at 39 weeks because there's no difference in the outcomes for the babies and moms had better outcomes with lower C-section rates and lower hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. You can see why such a conclusion is very controversial. There's a lot of backlash in the academic community and in and from patients. But in the first part of this video series, we talked about why you should be induced at 39 weeks. In this video, we will talk about why you should not be induced at 39 weeks and why the ARRIVE trial may not apply to you. So when everybody comes across the 39th week of pregnancy, they are allowed to have a elective delivery, whether it's by C-section or induction. So the question is, should you stay pregnant or should you deliver? In this video, we're going to talk about the reasons why you should stay pregnant and why the benefits seen in the ARRIVE trial may not apply to you. So the ARRIVE trial, again, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, very large trial, randomized, published in 2018. Their data and conclusions supported inducing everybody at 39 weeks of pregnancy. So why you should not be induced between 39 weeks and zero days and 39 weeks and four days. This is the five day window as part of the study design of the ARRIVE trial. When patients were randomized into the induction group, they were scheduled for an induction at about 38 weeks for 39 weeks and zero days to 39 weeks and four days. So summary, number one, induction did not lower the primary outcomes of complications for newborns, meaning induction of labor did not improve the outcomes for babies overall. Number two, the lower C-section rate may only be seen in a select group of patients. And number three, lower hypertensive diseases of pregnancy may also only be seen in a select group of patients, very similar to the benefits of a lower C-section rate. It may only apply to a subset of patients. The ARRIVE trial, again, they're trying to answer the question, should you stay pregnant or should you be induced at 39 weeks of pregnancy? So the study limitations, why the ARRIVE trial may not be applicable to everybody across the United States. Number one, the C-section rates were 18.6% versus 22.2%, a statistically significant relative reduction but only a 4% absolute reduction in the C-section rate. And as you'll see, the C-section rate varies widely across the country, making it very difficult to say if this benefit will be seen across the United States. Patients were also younger in this study and also more obese in this study. There was no data presented about the birth weights and how that affected the mode of delivery. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. And then the opt-in rate of only 27% probably leads to a large self-selection bias, which we'll also talk about. So the limitations of this study, the bad parts. The C-section rate varies widely across the United States. And again, if the C-section rate improvement was from 22.2% down to 18.6%, you could argue both ways. One, that the reduction in C-sections would only be seen in places with high C-section rates. If you have high C-section rates, there's a lot of room for improvement, and perhaps this study and their conclusions would help decrease the C-section rate. But you could also argue the other way. If you have a high C-section rate in this area, that the high C-section rate has nothing to do with whether they're induced or whether they're expectantly managed, the high C-section rate might be ingrained in the culture, the doctor, the practice, the hospital, the nurses, the patients, etc., so that no effort to change the culture is going to reduce the C-section rate. You could also say that on the opposite end, that if regions have low C-section rates, 
that it'd be dangerous or not possible to further reduce the C-section rate in those areas. So the age of patients, the average age of patients in this study were between 23 and 24 years old. The average patients in the United States who are pregnant, 28.7 years old. And when you stratify the data, the benefits in lower C-section rates tended to only be seen in patients younger than 35 years old. So age does play a factor into the benefits that the ARRIVE trial demonstrated. Obesity, 53% of the patients were obese. Again, with a 27% voluntary participation rate, that can lead to a self-selection bias, which then can influence the benefits and the conclusions of the ARRIVE trial. No birth weight data was presented. The average birth weight between the two groups was 3,300 grams versus 3,380 grams, so only a 80 gram difference, which is less than three ounces. You can see that there was also only about a five day difference between the average gestational age at delivery, 39.3 weeks and 40 weeks. And so that's about 39 weeks and two days versus 40 weeks. So overall, between the two groups, there was only a five day difference and an 80 gram difference. But if you look at the C-section rates and the operative vaginal delivery rates, I think it would have been helpful to know the average birth weight for each of these modes of delivery because you can see in the expectant management group, there were more C-sections for dystocia, which means the baby was getting stuck or the cervix was no longer dilating. There was also an increased risk of non-reassuring fetal status. So I think the birth weight data may have played a role in who would have benefited from expectant management and who would have benefited from being induced. Same thing with the operative vaginal deliveries. You notice a lower rate of dystocia and a higher rate of non-reassuring fetal status. Perhaps if you have a big baby, you're more gun shy when it comes to doing an operative vaginal delivery and, and thus influencing the outcomes. Self-selection bias, like we talked about, 27%. Only 27% of patients who were eligible for the study enrolled in the study. These patients tended to be younger and more obese, like we talked about. And so perhaps younger patients tend to see medical interventions more favorably and are more willing to be induced electively at 39 weeks. And obese patients may be electing to enroll in this study because they're more fed up with being pregnant and want to be delivered and no longer pregnant. It's hard to explain why younger patients and obese patients chose to enroll in this study at a disproportionately higher rate than other patients, but you can see why it can influence the data, the outcomes, and the conclusions. So the benefit of being induced at 39 weeks and the limitations of those benefits and those conclusions. So the composite neonatal outcome by the author's own admission is not statistically beneficial for the babies. Babies did not see a overall benefit in the outcomes of being induced. And you see that here, they wanted a p-value of 0.046, and what they had was a p-value of 0.049. A majority of the benefit was seen in respiratory support in the first three days of life, but in all the other outcomes, there was no statistical improvement in well-being of the baby. And who has a lower C-section rate? If you break it down by which groups of patients had a lower C-section rate, you see that it's only in white patients patients with a BMI of less than 30, and patients less than 35 years old. And so that can definitely influence the outcomes of being induced at 39 weeks. And so the applicability of this recommendation to patients in general may not be the best move, but I think it still does help provide some information for patients when they're trying to decide whether or not to stay pregnant or be delivered. Who has less hypertensive disorders of pregnancy? So again, the 
decrease in hypertensive disorders was rather significant, went from 14.1% down to 9.1%, which is a significant reduction of about 36%. But you have to remember, obesity is a huge confounding variable. Obesity is a very big risk factor for hypertensive diseases of pregnancy, so you're probably not going to see this benefit in the less obese patients. So again, in conclusion, these are the reasons that the data and the conclusions are limited in their application to patients in general. Number one, induction did not lower the primary outcomes. Remember, the primary outcomes for newborns were looking for complications or benefits of being induced early, and they technically did not find any when they looked at the overall composite scores. Number two, the lower C-section rate may only be seen in a select group of patients. Like we talked about, the effect of lowering the C-section rate was really only seen in white patients, patients with a BMI of less than 30, and patients who were less than 35 years old. And finally, the lower hypertensive diseases of pregnancy is also going to be possibly beneficial to obese patients and younger patients, but not patients in general, because obesity is definitely a confounding variable because it is a risk factor for hypertensive diseases of pregnancy in the first place. So this can definitely limit the benefits of being induced at 39 weeks. Hopefully that helps you clear up the reasons why you should be induced at 39 weeks and the reasons you should not be induced at 39 weeks. This is a very controversial study, but I don't think we have to either accept the study in totality or reject the study in totality. I think these studies, despite their limitations, they do have strengths, but Overall, they do add to our armamentarium of information and knowledge and data to help tailor the care to the individual. And that's what this channel is all about. It's about individualizing the care of the patient to that patient because patients can't be herded around like a flock of sheep. What's good for one person is not necessarily good for another. So hopefully you can use this two-part video series to help distinguish and answer that question if you should stay pregnant at 39 weeks or go ahead and be delivered at 39 weeks. If you've already watched the two parts in response to the ARRIVE trial, I also added a video about induction and risk of C-section and the success of induction based on a calculator developed at UPenn in a separate video. I also talk about the benefits of being induced at 39 weeks and how that would reduce the risk of stillbirth in this country. And that's in response to a paper that was published in response to the ARRIVE trial naturally. Everybody wants to know how to reduce the risk of stillbirth in this country because in the United States, we have one of the highest infant mortalities in the world. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you have any questions, please leave them below. Until the next video, stay healthy and stay educated. Thank you for watching this episode of Patient Education for the Educated Patient. I hope you found this content both helpful and meaningful, and that you'll be able to use it to live a healthier life. If there's any questions, please leave them in the comments section below. I do welcome feedback, so please also leave me any comments or suggestions in the comments section. Please subscribe and turn on the notifications, and I hope to see you at the next episode. Until then, Stay healthy and stay educated.